Welcome to the fifth screening in the Milestone series hosted by Sapsion, which is also the first in the program of online screenings organized in collaboration with Kurtizan. My name is Toffel, I'm one of the programmers of Kurtizan, and I'm here to provide you with some introductory notes to the film you're going to see. Now, from time to time, one finds oneself in front of a world of form so singular and so well crafted that it compels a certain feeling, a curious feeling of enchantment and wonderment that everything you get to see and everything you get to hear was carefully chosen, painstakingly considered and, and passionately loved before it was filmed, inevitably, meticulously. You get a feeling that you are tuning, as it were, into the prolonged echo of a profound desire, a desire to capture, articulate and share a certain beauty, not a supplementary beauty added merely for cosmetic purposes, but one that is, has always been present in places, on faces in gestures, in speech. A desire perhaps to embalm time, as André Bazin so feverishly described it, to stow away the, the changing appearances of history in the hold of life. And for me, one of these particular films is Amumia, or The Mummy, otherwise known as The Night of Counting the Years by the Egyptian filmmaker Shadi Abdel Salam, a film produced between 1967 and 1969. The first, the first time I've read about this film was in an interview with filmmaker uh, John Akinfra from uh, the mid-90s, when he mentioned the film as one of the prime models of what he called African altruism. An Egyptian film, he said, about what a contemporary, alienated Egyptian subject does with his or her history seemed like a major revelation to me. For a long time, however, the film was very hard to see, besides rare cinema screenings, there were only shabby video copies in, uh, in circulation. That is, until 2009-2010, when it was restored by, uh, by the Cineteca di Bologna, in association with the Film Foundation's World Cinema Project. And this is the version that you're going to see here. Now, I did not use the word beauty lightly, yeah, because the, the taste for beauty and aesthetics has undoubtedly accompanied Shadi Abdel Salam throughout his whole life, in particular the beauty that he found in here into his to his home country, Egypt. Abdel Salam was born in Alexandria, but his family was from Mbinye in, in Upper Egypt. So from the outset, he brought two different facets of Egypt within him, the cosmopolitanism and the Hellenist heritage of Alexandria on the one hand, and the traditions of Armenia that go back to the pharaonic period on the other. This concern for the duality of tradition and modernism was something that would become a threat throughout his creative endeavors. It was, however, not in cinema that he would find his first outlet within architecture, which he studied under Hassan Fateh, a man renowned for his promotion of ancient pre-industrial design methods and materials in his search of a modernism that would reflect the local context of, of Egypt. And it's precisely this tension between tradition and modernity tied to the search for cultural identity that is at the heart of Amumia, which is the first film that uh, Abdel Salam directed, after having been involved in the film industry as, as the designer of decorations and costumes for numerous historical Egypt Egyptian films, by amongst others uh, Salah Abu Saif and, and Youssef Shaheen, as well as some international productions by the likes of uh, Joseph Mankiewicz and, and Roberto Rossellini. It was notably Rossellini who proved to be instrumental in the procurement of the necessary funding for uh, Almumia, which is a project that has, that had occupied or haunted Abdel Salam ever since 1956, when he first read the story of the discovery of mummies in uh, Dira Bahri. He particularly found inspiration in, in a historical event that took place in 1881, uh, when it was brought to light that the tribe had been secretly raiding the, the royal tombs. It has to be noted that this particular year, 1881, occupies a significant place within uh, Egypt's national history. This is a time when a certain will to renaissance arose in Egypt, exemplified by the Urabi revolt against the British and, and French influence over the country, which was ended by the British conquest of Egypt. So by setting the film in 1881, Abdel Salam stages a kind of tension between ancient pasts and colonial history, particularly as played out in the arena of archaeology, when Egypt's past was rediscovered, antiquity systematically unearthed, 
and shipped to the West for exhibition and scientific uh, scrutiny. And this tension is embodied on one hand by the Hurabad tribe, and in particular Wanis, the son of the, of the tribe's chief, who learns that the tribe makes, it living, makes its living from the robbing uh, of the tombs, and as a result decides to revolt against his tribe and break with tradition. On the other hand, there are the archaeologists from Cairo, in particular Ahmed Kamal, an inspector in service of the Antiquities Organization. And then there's also an unnamed third character, a countryman from the valley, who will have a profound influence on the turn of events. You will notice that there are very stark sim visual similarities between these three characters, which is no coincidence, since Abdel Salam set out to draw attention to the question of the unification of uh, Egyptian identity, something which is even furthered by the fact that everyone speaks a deliberate classical Arabic, rather than any of the spoken dialects. But the tension between these different forces and different cultures, which is the axis of the film, is not only highlighted by the date of the film's setting, but also the period of its making, which is situated between the 60-day war in, in June 1967, which announced the end of President Nasser's Arab, Arab nationalist, nationalism and anti-imperialism, and the death of Nasser in September 1970, uh, which prompted an outpouring of grief across the Arab world. A few months before the beginning of the shooting, Abdel Salam's father also came to pass. It's then no coincidence that he himself has, has described this film as a film about lost parents, about an Egypt waiting to rediscover, rediscover itself in search for a, for a newfound identity, a film in which the, the dead seem ever-present while the living continue to struggle over their legacy, a film that finds its symbolic resonance in quotes from the Egyptian Book of the Dead that mark its beginning and its ending. And the result of the film you're going to see is a haunting meditation of, of, on identity, on loss and legacy. It's deeply melancholic tone, tentatively reflecting the sense of demise felt at the time of shooting. And its eerie, hypnotic quality underscored by its carefully measured pace, its twilight luminosity, and the stunning music by the great Italian composer Mar Mario Nascimbene, who used an instrument of his own invention to create slowly mutating sound sculptures in the vein of uh, William Basinski or, or, or uh, Brian Eno. When La Mumia was completed, uh, Rossellini ensured that the film received an international audience at festivals throughout uh, Europe in 1970, winning amongst others the Sadou Prize of the French Cinémathèque and the Golden Prize at the Carthage Cinema Festival in, in Tunis. However, the film was not to receive a release in Egypt until uh, February 1975, an event that was sadly eclipsed by the death of the renowned Egyptian singer Um Kulthum, which plunged the whole country in, into mourning. So death, it seems, kept on haunting the film. Abdel Salam, for his part, continued to delve into Egypt's Egypt's history and culture with uh, sub sub subsequent short and documentary films. But the great sweep of his cinematic work began to take a single direction, preparations for his magnus opus, entitled Achnaton, which would have dealt with the reign and the legacy of the eponymous phar pharaoh. However, in spite of 15 years of intensive preparation and research, during which he not only wrote the screenplay, but also designed the costumes, the decors and decorations for the film. Shadi Abdel Salam was never able to see his dream project come to, come to fruition. He passed away in October 1986, leaving us with a legacy that continues to brim with life and promise. And Al Mumia, for me, for us, is undoubtedly the, the epitome of that undying promise. So do enjoy the film. <laughs>